I'm Brenda Schufeld. I'm the uh, History Room Coordinator for the Hudson Area Library. And welcome to Huberste Verat. How savage, I'm so happy that I said that right. <laughs> Sorry. How Savage the World, The Role of Women in Leisler's Rebellion by Dr. David Voorhees. Um, this lecture is one of uh, many collaborations that we do throughout the year with the Leisler Institute. And we're very grateful for this partnership and to be working with Dr. Voorhees, the director of the institute that's headquartered, as I think most of you know, on Green Street in Hudson. The Hudson Area Library has a history room that's dedicated to the preserving and making accessible the history of Hudson, Stockport, and Greenport, which are our library service areas. We're open to the public Saturdays from 10 to 1. That's when our volunteers are here to answer your questions and also by appointment, and you can always email me, and that information is on our website. Um, and we give, we have online research requests. The basic request is free for your local history questions that you can fill out a form on our website to have that service. Uh, the Jacob Leisler Institute for the Study of Early New York History is an independent, not-for-profit study and research center devoted to collecting, preserving, and disseminating information relating to colonial New York and English rule. And these lectures are made partially possible through the generous support of the Van Dyke Family Foundation and Hudson River Bank and Trust. Anyone wishing to donate to the library's history room and the Leisler Institute, there is a donation box just outside the door, and you can also visit our website, which is historyroom.hudsonarealibrary.org, and donate there. The donation, if you write a note saying you attended this lecture and you want to split, will be split 50-50 with our organizations. Um, we will be off in terms of programming for the summer, but we'll still be open for Saturdays and by appointment. And we will resume on September 14th with uh, the Hendrick Hudson chapter of the DAR. Uh, we're collaborating with them on a whaling lecture that they're going to be <laughs> programming for the whaling masters. Descendants of whaling masters from New Bedford. Yes. Who will be descending upon our town, <laughs> our city for that weekend for their annual conference. It's the first time their conference is here, so we're very excited. And our next Leisler collaboration will be on October 26th with Heidi Hill, the site manager at Schuyler Mansion and Fort Prelo Historic Sites. So uh, without further ado, David, the founder and director of the Leisler Institute, managing editor of De Havamon, will be speaking. This is not the first time I've presented this paper, but events over the past five years have created a need to revisit the topic. History has to be rewritten in every generation, historian Christopher Hill wrote, because although the past does not change, the present does. Each generation asks new questions of the past and finds new areas of sympathy as it relives different aspects of the experiences of its predecessors. 21st century minority demands that the historical narrative be inclusive have resulted in rethinking interpretations. This is particularly true for colonial New York, where emphasis has been on European males. The opening 2019 paragraph for this paper is illustrative. In June 1689, during the early stages of the New York uprising that placed Jacob Leiser in power, I wrote, an eruption of violence in New York City saw Trincha Jans, wife of Kingston Judge Justice Jan Yostin, brutally attack royal council member and Leisler opponent, Nicholas Baird. Baird complained that Trincha was a major instigator of the riot that, that nearly led to his murder. And it was she who was, quote, very active in the fury. 
10 months later, and 150 miles to the north in Albany, the widow Schuyler beat Larzer's commissioner and chief aide, Jacob Melbourne, breaking his arm, it was reported, during the scuffle. At Larzer's execution for treason in New York City on May 16, 1691, a gentleman noted with horror that the execution was taking out Larzer's heart as it was said to bring it to a lady who had promised him a reward for it. <laughs> Reports later claimed that the lady had held a bloody organ aloft before a crowd while shrieking, here is the heart of a traitor. Intention in this paragraph was to highlight that women, like men, took a strong and aggressive political stand in colonial New York. A colleague suggested, however, that the use of the term female violence in my summary could imply that women acted, quote, emotional and not purposeful. This suggestion made me take a fresh look at my interpretation. Indeed, I realized that men are the source of all these quotes. Bayer uses a woman's leadership to highlight the mob's irrationality. The widow Schuyler's beating of Milborn was a rumor meant to discredit Liza's regime. And the shrieking lady holding aloft Liza's heart was an 18th century urban legend with no basis. Nonetheless, women indeed played a prominent role in the uprising. Historian Charles McCormick, in his study of the period, for example, pointed out Got to do a click here, pointed out that the rebellion responded to its own internal leaders, among them a woman. How then can their political involvement be explained? Late 20th century historians suggested that 17th century New York women, as heirs of colonial Dutch culture, were an independent and contentious lot. New Netherland records reveal cursing, kicking, biting, scratching, and punching females. We Chiriniers, ancestors of some of New York's most distinguished families, was noted in her own day for running along the shore, hoisting her skirts to moon sailors on ships approaching the harbor. <laughs> Despite the West India Company's efforts to screen its settlers, many of its colonies women came from the marginal fringes of European society. And, as historian Charles Boxer notes, were apt to be more conspicuous for their adventuresomeness than for their morals. In short, the first generation of settlers were of a type frequently found in frontier communities, laborers' wives, adventuresses, and social and religious outcasts. If some New Netherland women exhibited a tendency for tumult, the province's Roman Dutch legal heritage enhanced their economic status in the frontier setting. In New Netherland, historian Linda Beaver declared, both Dutch and English women lived under Roman Dutch law, which presented them as individuals, putting women on the same rights and privileges as their male counterparts. While Dutch culture remained firmly within Western European patriarchal tradition, historian Susanna Romney notes that the social freedoms women enjoyed in the Republic surprised foreign observers. Women appeared in public alone unescorted, hugged and kissed male friends at will, retained their maiden names upon marriage, freely gathered together on chaperoned, ran businesses, and publicly expressed their opinions. English traveler Joseph Shaw wrote in 1709 that Dutch women, quote, were generally bred to accounts and affairs and labor as much as their hus husbands. As Trayton Van Lemphoek's uh, leading women on the siege of Freydenburg Castle in Utrecht in 1577, shown here in contemporary print, there was a long history of women's activism in the Republic. In late 17th century New York, however, 
Women must also be seen in the context of contemporary British conventions, which were increasingly dominating the legal and cultural environment. As much comment as 17th century observers made about the freedoms of Dutch women, so too did they make about the submissiveness of English women. Anglican doctrine taught that, quote, a woman is a weak creature not endured with men's strength and constancy of mind. English law placed her a femme covert under the guardianship of a husband, father, or a male head of house. Popular male convention questioned whether she had either a mind or a soul. She could not own property nor defend or institute an action in court. She was, quote, a weaker vessel of frail heart, inconstant, and with a word soon stirred to wrath. Ideally, in both Holland and England, men and women occupied separate and distinct spheres. A man practiced his trade, while women woman attended to the household. But custom and law created by the 17th century marked markedly diff, uh, different attitudes toward women in each country and in their colonies. Whereas a New England man sought a wife of incomparable meekness and spirit, a New Netherland man sought a wife, as a popular Dutch song went, for a house friend. I thank the good Lord for having granted me such a good partner, Jeremiah Van Rensselaer wrote of his wife, Maria Van Cortland. Van Rensselaer's sentiment, historian Martha Shattuck noted, reflected, quote, a recipro reciprocal relationship, a shared responsibility. Because Dutch law recognized joint ownership of the property a woman brought into a marriage, wives held potential economic influence. If, for example, she felt that her husband was mismanaging her portion of the estate, she could appeal to the courts and have him removed as an administrator. Moreover, having made a joint contribution to the marriage and thus being equally responsible for its debts, a wife had a personal stake in the proper handling of the household's economic interests. By the 1680s, however, New York women found English law eroding their access to economic and legal independence. When in 1674, the States General permanently ceded New Netherland to England, the institution of common law in the region curtailed a woman's access to the courts. Where a woman had previously been, previously been able to initiate a legal action, she now needed a male guardian. The 1683 New York Charter of Liberties further narrowed women's rights. Article 23 made all women a femme clover, and Article 25 restricted property ownership by limiting the period a widow may tarry in the chief house of her husband to 40 days, and what she could inherit to a third part of the estate. Mm -hmm. By 1684, by 1684 Act of Assembly, women no longer could purchase land or conduct business in their own name. Though King James II disallowed the char charter as soon as he became king in 1685, the Assembly's restrictions on women remained in effect. The decade immediately preceding the 1689 rebellion, uh, witnessed the greatest erosion of women's rights. Linda Beamer's 1979 study of 17th century New York women explores how the independence of women declined as English control grew. According to Beamer, women found themselves increasingly excluded from the decision-making process and her power waning as men replaced women in leading economic roles. She notes that after 1674, the prosecution of women in criminal cases soared from a negligible 0.0064% of the total to 16.3% in the 18th century. We can surmise, she wrote, that women stripped the, uh, 
of the ways to make a legitimate living resorted to illegitimate means. The changes in law must have left many women feeling helpless as they grappled to accustom themselves to English laws of coverture. Marietje Jantz, widow of Robert Lokermans and a shrewd business person, found herself, quote, ignorant in matters when coping with English legal complexities. Possibly some women turned their frustrations toward their mates as they found their ambitions thwarted. In 1679, Margaret Hardenbrook, who two years earlier the English government had refused to allow to continue to trade with the same rights she enjoyed as she had enjoyed under the Dutch, undertook a joint shipping adventure with her husband, Frederick Phillips. Margaret, one of New York's wealthiest merchants, exercised total control over the voyage, turning her husband and the crew, passenger Jasper Dankers noted, into, quote, wretched manservers. Alita Schuyler never let her husband, Robert Livingston, forget that he was still subject to mistakes, misjudgments, and the need of constant prodding from her. Nonetheless, no organized feminist movement emerged to protest this deterioration in women's status. One reason may be in the Anglo-Dutch concept of the sexes as complementary halves of a whole, of marriage as a partnership with husbands and wives forming a unit. In the Netherlands, a wife's role carried into the public realm. The law excluded women from political offices. Women in the Republic managed nonetheless to assert themselves both individually and collectively in public life. As regents of, of orphanages, hospitals, old age homes, houses of correction, and other institutions, women formed networks of family alliances and offices analogous to, but not necessarily identical with, the region coalitions of their husbands. New York's standard European population did not allow for the development of such sophisticated institutions. But in the familial and business associations, women replicated competing networks and hierarchical structures of the old world. The partnership unit manifested political action, a spouse viewing their mates' enemies as their own interfamilial, as their own, inter, <coughs> sorry, as their own. Interfamilial feuds are evident in the political factionalism in 1689-1691. Another reason may be that the rapidly increasing standard of living, particularly among the wealthy, caused new tensions as families maneuvered to secure their position in an emerging provincial elite. When England's 1688 glorious revolution replaced the Roman Catholic James II on the throne with the Protestant William and Mary, the resulting collapse of governmental authority in New York unleashed pent-up personal hostilities. Historian uh, Laura's letter wrote that the character and complexion of the rebellion was a result of 20 years of strained personal relationships. According to this view, disputes arose as men jockeyed for power in a still unstable frontier society. Historians traditionally trace political affiliations through the patronymic and the male line. Documents, however, suggest that female jockeying for power played just as powerful, as powerful a role. Joyce Goodfriend notes, it was women in New York who transmitted religious, ethnic, and political identities. In order to understand political alignments, it is necessary to look at wives and their relationships. Familial hostilities originating in sibling rivalry between Liza's wife, Elsie, and her stepsisters, Maricha and Janitja, are an example. While the exact causes for the dispute are unclear, the fact that, unlike their husbands, the sisters never jointly appear as witnesses at baptism 
or in any other capacity, suggests that the feud predates their marriages. The stepsisters were hostile before their husbands were drawn into the fray. The bitterness between Jacob Leiser and the Kirsteda and Bayer families becomes comprehensible when examining their wives' feud. Margaret Schuyler, widow of Philip Schuyler, and the previously mentioned attacker of Jacob Milborn was matriarch of the anti leslerian leadership. Her son Peter was mayor of Albany. Daughter Gertrude married New York City Mayor Stephanus Van Cortland. And daughter Alita and Robert Livingston, and then Alita married wed Robert Livingston. Her children's marital connections also included the anti leslerian teller and for blank. Families. The Scottish sisters' activities in the 1680s reveal how marital partnership carried into the political arena. Gertrude Schuyler, New York City Mayor Stephanus Van Cortland's wife, whom contrary to English law he termed the mayoress, oversaw official paperwork for her husband. Sister Alida acted in a similar capacity in concert with her husband, Robert Livingston's conduct of offices. When in September 1689, the newly elected Lyslerian New York City Common Council bought Gertrude an order for the papers of government, quote, she did throw it away out of the doors and made answer they would take it with force in case they would have it. When Alita was questioned about the mints and other books and papers, etc., belonging to Albany, her reply was, she has no knowledge, which was viewed with skepticism. Wives and husbands were an inseparable unit. A wife's ignorance of public matters was absolutely impossible. Elite New York women could not have assumed the legal and business capacities they undertook had they not been able to read, write, and keep ciphers. Historian David Narrett finds a higher rate of New York women signing wills than did contemporary women in New England or in the Chesapeake. 50% of New York females could write, while only 40% of Boston women were literate. This rate followed the pattern of the Dutch Republic where, by 1690, female literacy ranged from 35% in Groningen to 60% in Devender. During the same period, male literacy was 80% in New York and 96% in Devender. With high literacy, the pen served as a tool for women of both New York factions. New York women wrote and circulated political lampoons, satires, and tracts. In January 1690, for example, among several uh, seditious letters against Liza's government seized by mail carrier John Murray were ones written by the ferryman's wife. She was arrested and confined to jail. Liza also sought Gertrude Schuyler to answer for her letters, but, quote, Van Cortland and his wife had made their escape. Women also acted as secretaries and couriers for their husbands. When in June 1689, Nicholas Baird's wife, Judith Verlet, was brought before Larson's council, her purse was discovered to contain numerous letters for the opposition. Handwriting analysis often reveal letters to be in the hand of others than that of the signatory. How often wives and daughters served in a secretarial capacity is unknown. But a tradition was firmly established by the 18th century when William Livingston's daughter, Susanna, composed most of his letters. With Royal, Henry, uh, with Royal Governor Henry Slaughter's execution of Jacob Lawson in May 1691 and the imprisonment or flight of a leading man of his party, Leslarian wives, sisters, do and daughters resorted to the pen for redress. Somewhere here, my picture is at about one done. Uh, in June 1691, Bostonian Jacob Maline asked Judith Blage that since there should be none of all the revolution men able to keep such notes as might give an account of their friends, 
and redress them by their majesties, and I cannot write to any of my friends for fear of miscarrying, to gather a true account and send it under cover. He also requested Jacob Milborn's sister to, quote, send me the dying and last speeches of Liza and Milborn, and how their poor wives do and are dealt with. Scores of women kept busy petitioning the government and royal, petitioning the provincial and royal governments, preserving the records of Liza's administration, and sending detailed accounts of events to friends in Europe. Elvis, author of the title of this paper, composed verses relating to the, quote, despicable lies spread by Liza's opponents. Uh, the contrast between English and Dutch attitudes for women is apparent in the Lyslerian attempts to procure a redress. William III was simultaneously Stadtholder of Holland and King of England, and Lyslerian sought his patronage through both governments, where men such as Jacob Lyslerian Jr. and Colin Van Rensselaer lobbied in London. It was women who petitioned in the Republic. In August 1691, Magdalena Claus, wife of Herman Wessels, began several days of testimony before the Hof of Van Holland, that is, the provincial government in Amsterdam, regarding the honorable and high-worthy Commander Leisler and the miserable end and reward of that illustrious personage. Magdalena's lengthy testimony, affirmed by those of other women and men, was influential. In October 1691, the Dutch States General sent her testimony to Lord Henry Sidney, brother of Algernon Sidney, to bring before the king. The price that men made women pay for their involvement in Europe was harsh. One woman wrote, they endeavored to endure all of us utterly who have sided with Leisler. Elsie Liza found, as she wrote to her son in August 1691, I am now stripped of all and have nothing left for me and your sisters to live on, and am now forced to borrow money to buy bread with. With her husband's properties shipped and businesses confiscated by a tender of treason, Elsie attempted to retain those properties she had brought into her marriage. Without such property, she petitioned, she had no means for the support of her family. Nonetheless, in January 1692, uh, Governor Richard Inglesby evicted her from her home. Forbidden to leave the province, she was forced onto the frigid winter streets of Manhattan, while those who offered her shelter were hounded. The wives of the other leading men of Eliza's party faced similar frightening situations. Their sufferings did not last long. Through Queen Mary's intervention, the persecution of Leslarian wives was commanded and ended in March. With her estates restored, Elsie assumed the de facto leadership of her husband's party. In 1694, she requested Daniel Pohemus and Rolla Van Kirken on Long Island to give some money to help bear the expenses incurred by my son in England for the cause of those who have been in prison here, because I cannot bear the heavy burden alone. She nevertheless tirelessly continued to work until each of her husband's supporters was exonerated. Female marital and associational, net associational networks persist permeate New York's elite political leadership throughout the subsequent colonial period. Liza's female descendants, for example, dominate the unions of pro-Whig factions. Under Whig Governor Richard Coote, Earl of Bellamont, Assembly Speaker Abraham Gouverneur was wed to Liza's daughter Mary. Royal Council Member Robert Walters to Liza's daughter Kathleen and council member Samuel Stocks was brother-in-law to Liza's daughter, Francina. The influence of their marital unions continued well into the 18th century with the Marisite and Livingston factions. Liza elicited, Liza elicited strong response from women of both parties. 
and D, it is women who provide the most details of the, his execution, revealing that Liza was, quote, brought to the gallows on a sledge, hanged till half dead, then beheaded. While I focused on the writings of elite women, his, his greatest popularity was among the middling classes, whose access to managing the local affairs he greatly expanded. Retha, evidence suggests that Liza's governments also attempted to address the erosion of women's rights. His government, for example, being informed that Mrs. R.G. Rondell could not be safe in her personal influence in her county and could not receive justice, opined that whether the case is proved before any justice in an adjoining county, that he, by due course of law, may administer justice to the said Mrs. Rondell. Perhaps for this reason, Liza's execution had a particularly emotional impact on women. As the executioner's axe fell in a drizzling rain on May 16, 1691, it was reported, quote, the shrieks of the people were dreadful, especially of the women. Some fainted, some were taken in labor. The, fair one, the Ford one barely touches upon women's involvement in political events in the Lazarian period. Moreover, the interpretation presented here will undoubtedly modify as new manuscripts are uncovered, transcribed, and translated. And more importantly, particularly as we learn more about the women of the middling and servant and enslaved classes who were the vital component of that era, Historians have only begun to embark upon our voyage of discovering the contributions of all peoples in creating the world we inhabit today. An exciting and never-ending journey, resolving old questions and finding new mysteries. One thing is for certain, I'll never get bored. Thank you. <laughs> So if anyone has any questions or comments on the lecture, you are more than welcome. Yes. Um, you, you spoke earlier, I know I got in five minutes late, but you spoke about the Roman Dutch um, tradition, I think in Roman, Roman Dutch law. Okay, what, what, is, the, what yeah. is that? What was that? Well, that's based on the parallel, like on the part of Justinian, on the Roman Dutch law, as opposed to using Germanic English common law, which is what the English would come the English So the so the English common law is based on a, a Germanic background and right. the Dutch is based on the on the English, Roman. On the Roman law. Mm. So mm. There's, a, there, there's a big difference in in a lot of legal aspects, obviously. Any other questions or comments? Yes. So, oh yeah. So if if women couldn't own property or couldn't retain the property of their husbands if they were widowed, then who provided for their wives and the well, wives of their children? You have an L but suppose you didn't. Go, in in, in yeah. English law, the state goes to the oldest son. Right, but and if they didn't have then you know like Jane Austen novels are full of. <laughs> I'm this, sorry. I mean, that you read like the Jane Austen novel when estates were entailed away, then often the woman is left kind of nowhere. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, you're hopeless. Now, now in, 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 um, in New York, there, there was a period where people went by both laws and mm -hmm. created a lot of uh, estate feuds because, uh, according to Dutch law, so I think everything we see, everybody receives its share equally. And so some people, but this is what happens with Washington the state when, when it's returned by the English government. Um, both the, the two factions, of, one is declining the English law to get the entire state, the other is using the Dutch, um, Dutch law. It's a real few to go. That last until. Actually, some of these little feuds last right up to the uh, American Revolution. But the easiest way to settle, I think, what a lot of people did is they married their cousins. 
So, and the elite, we're talking about now the elite. What, what, what they would do is they would marry their cousins, and then that, 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 that would the white chef, and you know, most everybody wants it to this table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hate to display my ignorance, but I don't, I still don't quite know who Leisler was. Okay. And why he was hanged. Okay. Jacob Leisler was uh, a New York City merchant. He came here, he was born into a, 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 he was actually born into the gentry in Germany. And he came here as, a, as a, an eagle horse to save a soldier in behalf of the Dutch West India Company in 1660. In 1663, he married uh, Elsie Timons, who was the widow of Peter Canales van der Um which we, and was related to the leading families in the metal at the time. Um, Weiser emerges as one of the richest merchants in the in, in, in New York colony. Um, he's involved in all kinds of different aspects of New York's economic development. Uh, it's, he's also a very devout pietist and a millenarian. He believes that the second coming of the Christ is imminent, as many people did at this point in time. So he's a very devout Protestant. And in 1688, there's what's known as the Glorious Revolution, where the Roman Catholic King James II was overthrown on behalf of the Protestant William. Uh, Stadhold of Holland and his wife Mary, who is the Protestant daughter of James II. Um, the revolution uh, causes the uprisings in all the American colonies and was the assumed government of New York at that point in time. His refusal, uh, I mean, it's a whole kind of complex thing, Weiser's administration. Uh, provides a lot of um, access to local government of, of people who've been denied it in the middle class. So in a way, he's a, very, he's a populist leader. Um, when the new royal governor comes in, Liza refuses to immediately hand over the fort to him without any evidence. So when he does hand over the fort, he's taken for his refusal and refused to treason. Um, there's bitter division, particularly among the elites, and the division is basically caused by this family feud. They go way back. And a lot of them deal with the Hurrius, the Hurrius uh, suits. So his in-laws petition the governor, convince the governor that he should be executed. So mm. when no further uprisings in the calm. So the governor was he hesitant to do it, but riots did break down on Wise's behalf. So he executed Lysler and, and his son in law for treason. The case then went to England, it went before Parliament, and the treason sentence was reversed. So the estates were returned to the family. Lysler is the only governing official in American history who has been executed and beheaded. So, um, and the result of the divisions that resulted out of this, out of this whole political feud lasted up until the American Revolution. And it would be a very strong two-party system that developed in New York on before the revolution. So <laughs> it gets it gets a lot, it gets complicated, but Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. By the way, the book, this area plays a big part in what's going on here too. As you know, Livingston Manor, Livingston, Robert Livingston was a uh, an opponent of Jacob Watson. And then, amazingly, he becomes a leader of the Lysleria party in the, er in the uh, early 18th century. He switches parties, but he seems to his advantage. 
Larian party? I'm sorry? Lys party, did you say? Yeah, he becomes, he switches parties and they do. A lot of people do that with factionalism. They, they, they switch when it's for their own advantage, their own economic advantage. Hmm. What was the other party called? Well, they were, that, they were called the anti Lys <laughs> And, and <laughs> they're also <laughs> called Lys in, in contemporary, uh, they, they were, they said that they're called whites and blacks. Two different. Um, and then eventually they, 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 they said, well, you know, it's known as the Morris sites and all the things. Is that the Robert Livingston who lives, lived at Claremont? Robert Livingston who? Lived in Claremont in that, the house on well, the Well, that's, that's, that's his grandson. Oh, that's his grandson. Um, Robert Livingston is. The one who was out with the Manor, the great of the Manor. Uh -huh. And all that occurs during this whole period. Um, and uh, he marries Alita Scott, uh, who was who had been married to uh, Nicholas Van Rensselaer. These people are all interrelated in the, in the elite. And basically, what I've been dealing with are the papers of the elite. That we do know that there's a lot more out there related to the middle class, and that's what we've got to start looking at. Um, there's work now being research now being done on enslaved, enslaved women, but it's so important that we also know what's going on with the non-enslaved serving class and what's going on with the middle class. Mm -hmm. it's, this is a period that, and one of the reasons why I've, sta I've established this institute is that this one, this. This era is so uh, important in the establishment of our culture today, and yet it's very neglected. I mean, what happens is you've got the, the Zenger trial, and we, we, freedom of the press comes out of, and you've got Robert Jaya, which is the beginning of paleontology. There's so much going on in this, in this period. And by looking at the Lys Larry event, that means Lys's family, you really begin a whole history of what's going on in the, in the late 17th and 18th century. They're involved in everything. Uh, his grandsons were one of the founders of the Bank of New, of, of, of New York. I mean, it's, it's amazing. What kind of resources are there for the non-elites, for the, you know, step down? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to go through. I, I know, for example, you know, genealogy. I'm an awful lot of material that really, I'm sorry about that. Um, find an awful lot of material. For okay. example, with my own family, they, a family association found letters in Holland that had been written from here. And they were written in this period, and they actually mentioned the events going on, mm -hmm. the political events going on, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, so many that have not been looked at, so much material. And one of the reasons, of course, is that, that the languages we use are, are Dutch and French. A lot of them are written in Dutch and French. And they get to be transcribed, translated, transcribed and translated. Are there any documentaries about this time? I mean, these characters that you're studying? Were there any? I'm documentaries? Sorry. Are there any doc doc? No. I mean, you're asking that doc, you're asking now? Have we yeah. asked that? No, not really. Mm -hmm. That's what's so amazing. I mean, it's a very, you, you go from, the, there's an incredible amount of work being done by the Netherlands Institute into the Dutch colonial period. It's wonderful work, wonderful work. Russell Shorter's book has mm -hmm. popularized it. Um, and then, until you get up to the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. Very, I mean, there's things that have been read, but they're <coughs> very important, read like the, 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 the Negro Conspiracy of 1741. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of that, which was a very important event that occurs. Um, slavery in New York, I mean, is 50%, almost 50% of every of households in New York has had a slave in the household. It's an enslaved person. It's, and yet we just tore down Schuyler's statue in front of the, in Albany. It was just pulled down this weekend. Yeah. 
because he owned slaves. Well, I mean, I, I, hopefully we're not erasing, we're not erasing the history itself. I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, trade with the Native Americans and what's going on with, between European and Native Americans. And it's, there's so many things that need to be explored more fully. Um, we can't ignore any, 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 and that's one of the things that I'm trying to bring out. You can't ignore women. You just cannot. You. And yet history has been with women for of those period for 200 years where women are totally ignored. And they don't know what the historians just don't get. Uh, past historians just don't get. Well, hey, if you look at the women's relationships and their feuds with each other, then all of a sudden, oh my, now I understand why these families are fighting. But if you don't look at the women, you have no clue. It's just like they're all crazy people. It, just, it doesn't make sense. So, and it's the same way with, um, with other groups. You've got to, you know, you can't ignore slavery. You just cannot ignore slavery. They played such a vital role in, in, in the economy. And, 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 that, um, in, in, in the era before, before industrialization. And, 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 uh, I think it's really important to bring out what their contribution is. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. So you talked about the difference between how uh, the rule, the laws for women and women's place in society, and between England and the Netherlands, right? And how that was kind of in the mix in New Netherlands, right? And would would it be the same? I was wondering with enslaved people, there were different laws that were governing enslaved people in those countries. Was that part of that kind of nebulous period that before the horrid institution of slavery in the, in the United States solidified? Um, I, no, I think that, the, no, I know, I know what you're saying. Uh, slavery was outlawed within the Netherlands itself. Oh, okay. But it's because of the decentralized nature of the government that, that they allowed it in all their colonies. I mean, apartheid is a Dutch word. So, um, and, and the Dutch had slave, made a huge amount of money off of slavery and the slave trade in all their colonies, slave colonies. Um, I sound like I'm lost in what you're, what you're asking. But the, I, I just wonder because the, tra the transition that occurs in the occurs in all the colonies. Mm -hmm. It occurs in it first occurs in the Chesapeake and then we go in and, and then Virginia and New York, where uh, the racial laws uh, solidify and then black child slavery. Mm -hmm. the, the initially slavery, probably in all the colonies, uh, in the very early 17th century was looked more like a as it was in, 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 in Rome, in ancient Rome, and now in Roman law. I know in, 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 in Dutch law, they initially were like looking at it from a Roman law standpoint. So that it was not a perpetual thing, and it was not based on one's skin color. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I don't just, know if that answers your question, but well, just, yeah, I mean it did because you're saying there wasn't the same uh, coexistence of two different countries' laws. Uh, you, you see, in all the colonies, and it happens about the same time. It, it happens in, in the Chesapeake. It happens in Europe. Around the, the, the laws begin to become harsher. You know, mm -hmm. you were talking about half freedoms with the, with the Dutch and, and everything. And uh, the laws begin to get harsher and harsher. And after the English take over, and I don't believe it's because of the English. I believe because it's just what's going on. Yeah. And, and you find in the sermons and everything else that 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 that, 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 that box are marked with a uh, uh, what's the form of yeah, like, mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Um, and there's there's arguments that go on about that. And the, well, I said uh, interesting enough is that there's a a very important case that happens in 1676 between Nicholas Van Rensselaer and, and, and Jacob Leiser. And it's on um, Nick Van Rensselaer gives a sermon on, on the origin of original sin. And in the case, he meant, 
in his claim that he mentioned that original sin is like the color of, of, of the Negro's skin. And Liza took exception to that. Um, the churches forbid eventually come to the conclusion that blacks should not be educated and they should not be Christianized. Liza was opposed to that. He believed that their souls had to be saved. He believed that they were human beings. Now, he was not against slavery because he did not have, if that was an era when slavery was part of the economic system, but it was not perpetual and it was not based on your skin color. And so he was an opponent to that, uh, which makes him rather strange for that point in time. There really is not a slavery movement until the Quakers in the 1680s and until Pennsylvania began agitated. But the slave laws in New York become just horrendous. And I, I, my own personal feeling is that it was more awful in New York because in the South you had these plantations where there were, people had a community, a sense of community. In the North, blacks were isolated. Mm -hmm. they, no more than three could gather together um, without their master's consent. So people were really isolated. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we know. It's not a topic. But mm -hmm. Again, it's a whole period that we really need to, mm -hmm. to look at and study. And I just, <coughs> oh, excuse me, just wanted to mention that a couple of months ago I went down to Younger's to Phillips Manor Hall, which right. has been um, completely, uh, there's been a lot of restoration there, but reinterpretation. And they really deal squarely with the fact that Adolf Phillips was a huge slave trader. Um, not just a slave owner, but he was very, you know, that was his business. As it, I'm going to say Adolf and Frederick, but I'm not quite sure which, which generation or both generations. Yeah. Now, first, there's, there's a very interesting case where uh, that Jacob Lezer is on, uh, uh, an appointed Admiral Court Justice on, and involves Frederick Phillips, uh, and there's a shipment, an illegal shipment of, of slaves, because it was supposedly the Royal African Company at that point in time was supposed to be you the know, you know, monopoly, and other people, private people, private people could not be shipping slaves from Africa. And, um, so anyway, the, the, the British discovered that the shipment was coming in, so he dumped the slaves off in New Jersey, trying to hide, you know, trying to hide them. And uh, it's just a very, very interesting case that, that, that involves uh, the whole question of slavery and, mm -hmm. and the slaves coming in. But almost every merchant and right up to the Civil War, even when slavery was outlawed, it wasn't that law until 1827 in New York, uh, the business men were still making a great amount of money in the slave trade. In the slave trade. So we forget that. We, we, tend to, we tend to whitewash up our past. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, David. This was fantastic. Yeah.